I worked for 10 years in this development. And the first thing that I did was decide, since I don't know what the spacecraft is going to be like, or what kind of support I would have, I better develop a technology that is pretty self-supporting, doesn't need any help. And I did develop this little machine, which you can see in the slide, that I called Gulliver, because it was going to distant places looking for little Lilliputian tiny beings. And I thought this was a rather good name for it. The way it worked was first, it borrowed a technique from the whaling industry from 1860, which was a method to shoot out a whale harpoon. I miniaturized this to shoot out a string, which I coated with silicone grease to make it sticky. And it popularly became called the sticky string experiment. The way it worked was a little gun shot this string out. It went about 50 yards across the surface of a field, then fell to the ground. Inside the instrument was a tiny electric motor powered by a battery. The motor then turned on and reeled the string back in on a little spool. When it was dragged across the surface of the ground, it picked up tiny grains of soil. That's all I needed, because those grains are covered with microorganisms. I needed only a tiny few specks, maybe as much as 100 milligrams of soil. When the spool was wound up, the radioactive nutrient was dumped on it. And if anything was alive, radioactive gas would come out of the spool, made by the, uh, evolved by the microorganisms, would rise to the top of the machine, and there would be detected by a radiation detector. So we monitored the evolution of gas as time went on over several hours of the experiment. We tried this on a field near our laboratory, and were surprised we got positive responses immediately. But those of you who have taken even high school science know that the most important part of an experiment is the control. This is the part that proves the experiment really did what you thought. If I just got a positive response, how could I know that it came from microorganisms and not some chemical in the soil? So the control that I made was the following. If I got a positive response, I would run a duplicate experiment with a duplicate instrument, going out and bringing in a sticky string with soil on it, just as in the first test. But now, before I drop the radioactive material on it, I would drop a germicide, a strong germicide on it, hopefully to kill any microorganisms if they were present. Then I added the radioactive nutrient. If I still got a strong response, as in the first test, this meant that it wasn't a microorganism that was causing the release of gas, but some chemical. If, on the other hand, the response were strongly diminished or eliminated, that confirmed the fact that the first response came from microorganisms. When I ran that in our first field test, indeed there was a nil response to the control sample. We had detected microorganisms. From there we went on to a 10-year development program that not only developed four different versions of the instrument, but more importantly selected the nutrients with which to test for microorganisms. How do you select nutrients to look for microorganisms that might be on another planet. Well, what we did was assume that Mars was created out of the same material as Earth, and therefore its initial condition would be pretty much similar to that of Earth, and it was from those ingredients and under those conditions that life might have, might have evolved on Mars as it did on Earth. Therefore, we went to use the simplest, earliest organic materials thought to have developed on Earth. These were identified by the so-called Miller-Urey experiments in the early 50s. And these experiments used the materials on Earth in the atmosphere 
thought to have been present in the early atmosphere. Uh, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, water vapor, carbon monoxide, and expose those to strokes of lightning. In the experiment, the gas was in a large tube, the lightning was sparks of electricity. After a couple of days, organic matter formed, dark blotches on the glass. These were analyzed, and it was those organic compounds that formed from which we selected materials to be used in our experiment. We selected five of them, tested them extensively to be sure that microorganisms responded to them. We never found any microorganisms not to respond to them, and therefore on the basis of theory that they should have been or might have been the first organics formed on Mars as they might have been on Earth, and that microorganisms empirically responded to them, we thought they were pretty good bets. We tested hundreds of different kinds of microorganisms, pure species, mixed species, soils, field tests, uh, field tests we made at the top of a mountain above the timber line, as you can see in the accompanying picture, field tests we made on Death Valley, hot desert sands at the height of the day, and field tests on the very salty soil around the Salton Sea. In every case, we quickly detected living microorganisms. The experiment was never fooled. When we took soil samples and heated them to the control uh, temperature that was specified by NASA, they wanted a different control than the germicide. They specified 160 degrees Celsius for three hours treatment of the duplicate soil sample, then let it cool and test it. When we did that, in all of our field tests, we found a negative or nil response, confirming that the positive test responses were from microorganisms. After the 10 years of that development program, after many hundreds of tests established that the experiment was very effective, and the control always worked, and that the experiment could not be fooled by chemicals. We submitted a proposal to NASA when it announced openings for the Viking mission to Mars. In 1969, we learned that we had been selected as one of the life detection experiments to be developed for the actual mission. This was another 10-year effort. I was very fortunate in being able to induce Dr. Patricia Stratt to join my company to help me work on this development. She was able to take my ideas and to work with the engineering company, TRW, that was putting them into hardware and develop the instrument that eventually was flown to Mars. To do this, she even had to live for a while out with TRW in California to work very closely with the hardware development. It was remarkably successful. And we had a piece of that hardware in our laboratory back in Washington, D.C., where we could test microorganisms and be certain that we were getting the kind of instrument development that we needed. All went very well, although it was quite stressful, meeting the time demands of NASA to get ready for this experiment. Finally, the great day came, and blast-offs occurred in 1976 for the 10-month, 440 million mile journeys to Mars. Miraculously, the two spacecraft landed perfectly, some 4,000 miles apart as planned, and all of the experiments worked. 